I, I like to do something pretty uh, nuts and bolts for this kind of uh, talk, a craft talk. Uh, things that you can kind of uh, uh, maybe even start uh, playing with uh, tonight uh, if, if you want to write a, a, a poem, if you're working actually writing here. And uh, I, 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 uh, I mentioned at the end of the handout, there's a new craft book by Ed, Ed Hirsch, Edward Hirsch, called The Poet's Glossary. I actually noticed that, that it's here in the, in the bookstore. There are several copies. Uh, and I, I was reading through this, uh, and uh, I came across the epistolary uh, poem. It's not a brand new uh, thing, of course. It's been, uh, been maybe since the beginning of poetry. There have been epistolary poems, or at least since the beginning of, of written uh, poetry, there have been epistolary uh, poems. Dana made a point uh, yesterday in his talk that poetry started long, long before there was written language. Uh, uh, slight variation on what Dana said. Uh, the first poets were people uh, uh, chanting around a fire in, in a cave. And, uh, and maybe, I kind of think that this, at the same time somebody was banging a stick on a log uh, rhythmically and, uh, and maybe somebody else was putting their, their hands on the wall or painting an antelope or something like that. Uh, but as soon as poetry started uh, being written, uh, <coughs> epistolary poetry uh, began to appear. Uh, I say on here that about the only poem I remember in in high school, and at least getting in any way, was uh, 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 Pope's uh, uh, letter to uh, Dr. Arbuthnot. And for some reason, I, I remember that poem from high school. I don't remember uh, many many others. Uh, but it's something you could. I say at the, at the introduction to this that. Uh, uh, if you're writing a letter to a friend, if you're writing a real letter to somebody, it's never obscure. Uh, you might, you know, things might not be absolutely clear. clear. You can't articulate uh, exactly the way you want to. Usually you wouldn't know that if you're writing the letter, just like we don't know when our poems are unclear. But generally, if you're writing a letter, uh, you're trying to communicate uh, something. So if you're writing a letter that's also a poem, uh, you, you're trying to communicate, you're trying to make this kind of bridge between uh, a writer and a, and a poet. And I think every poem is like that to one degree. Aren't we always trying to uh, hope that there's at least one other people, one other person out there that gets what we're, what we're talking about? Isn't a poem something, isn't a poem a kind of letter to the world or to people uh, in the world that we hope makes this uh, connection, makes a kind of bridge that does what a mailman does? Uh, or at least what the male used to do, uh, uh, deliver uh, something. It's also maybe uh, uh, in a way worth doing now, and I've heard there's people doing this that are starting to write each other real letters again. Uh, and, and putting them in the, in the mail, actually. Uh, there's, there's a lot of us here, uh, 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 con contemporaries of mine, that in our first 10, 15, 20, maybe even 30 years of writing, the mail was a huge deal for a writer. Uh, uh, that's how you did all your business, was, was through the mail. Uh, that's how you sent out your poems, that's how you heard from your friends, because the tribe was always uh, scattered. Uh, I even remember a poem by uh, Stephen Dunn that he wrote about Thursday being the best mail day for some reason, and he had an argument, it made sense to me when, he, when I read the poem, yeah, that was always the day that most, uh, a lot of mail came, maybe more than, than other, other days. Uh, so maybe, not, now we don't uh, uh, communicate uh, by, uh, mail is boring now. Uh, it, it used to be, you know, you'd anticipate, you knew when the mailman was coming, there was almost always something possible that would be coming back in the mail, a letter from a friend or letters from friends and, 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 and stuff you'd send out. Uh, and now mail is boring. Uh, so, so maybe we should start writing letter poems uh, and sending them uh, through, through, through the mail, like a, a regular, uh, with a stamp on it. You know, they, you know those things, the envelopes, and they, they lick this thing, you put a stamp on it. They put it in those, those blue boxes. Uh, they're, they're on corners in a lot of uh, cities around different parts of the city. Uh, so so uh, it'll, it'll help, it, it'll make you be, be clear. 
And we know that's a, that's a difficulty uh, for, for all of us to, to make our poems lucid enough, to be able to look at our own poems as if we didn't write them, to make them clear enough. There's still room for mystery and strangeness and oddness and originality, plenty of room uh, for that. Clarity does not uh, diminish originality by, by any means. Uh, so uh, it, it's a way of making us do that. Maybe uh, also uh, we can talk about more personal uh, things. If you're writing to a specific uh, person, uh, maybe it's a little easier to uh, uh, open up. Uh, uh, but there's also lots of other letters that, that you can uh, write, I say in that uh, paragraph uh, towards the end. Uh, uh, this comes right out of Ed's, Ed's, Ed's book, uh, an uh, epistolary uh, poem. And another, another cool thing about that book is uh, most crafts books are kind of dry. Uh, the Princeton Encyclopedia is a great book and indispensable for, for any, any, any poet. But it's mostly written by professors. Uh, and uh, it has a lot of that language. And uh, uh, Ed's, Ed's is a big, big book. But it, uh, it's, it's very clearly uh, written. It doesn't sound like a, a professor is lecturing you on the, the <laughs> poetry of Borneo in the 12th uh, century or something like that. Uh, and there's also a kind of uh, a little playfulness here and there in it, a little bit of, of humor. And I think that's what he's doing in here. He uses an example of the epistolary poem being uh, uh, all the rage literary genre in the 14th century is Bekistan. Uh, not many people uh, know a single poem that was written in, by, uh, by uh, Uzbekistani. Uh, does anybody know a uh, Uzbekistani poet? Is that even the right word? Would there be a... Uh, uh, has anybody ever <laughs> heard of them? But what they were doing in the 14th century, uh, uh, love letters between nightingales and sheep. I don't know about that. That's a little weird. But uh, uh, maybe there are a lot of sheep and uh, maybe they were a little lonely. I don't know. Uh, but opium and wine, uh, what a neat idea to try to write a, a letter that's a discussion or, or a conversation between uh, opium and wine, or write a letter to opium or a letter to wine. Uh, this is my favorite though, uh, a, a letter between red and green. Red writes to green, green writes back to red. What could, what could you could come up with all sorts of stuff to play with uh, in, in a poem uh, like that. And I love this quote at the end. You know, this wouldn't be in the Princeton Encyclopedia, uh, this kind of li little bit of uh, play and, and, and humor. Uh, it's, it's in other craft books, but uh, I never saw it in the Princeton Encyclopedia. Uh, but, but one guy writes a, to a girl uh, that he tried to drink a lake so he could swallow her reflection. Good line, dude. I mean, a, a, a good line. Uh, uh, I don't know how that worked out for him, uh, but uh, that's, that's a pretty good line. It reminded me of uh, Van Gogh. Uh, he goes to uh, the house of a woman that he liked, uh, loved, or thought he loved. Not the woman he cut, for whom he cut off his ear, but another woman. And her father wouldn't let him in the house. Uh, and, uh, and he said, just let me see her as long as I can hold my hand in this flame, in the, in the lamp uh, flame. That's a good line too. I think he just kicked his ass out, but uh, it, didn't, it didn't work. But uh, that, that's a that's a good line. So I like that kind of the possibility for both the groundedness groundedness of a of a uh, uh, the possibilities of an epistolary poem, a letter uh, poem, uh, and the the range you could have with it, the fun you could have with it, the play you could uh, have with it, the different kind of things you could do. There's good examples in this in this short uh, uh, paragraph towards the end there. And it's something that anybody can kind of sit down and uh, and do. Now, and frankly, I've never, I don't think I've ever written, uh, at least setting out to do uh, writing what it could be called a letter or poem. Maybe I've written uh, a few that are, are like that, but there's something about that direct address uh, that is uh, more and more uh, appealing to me. Uh, it might be, maybe it's tied in with, uh, as one gets older, I think, I've always eschewed the, uh, the, the autobiographical as much as possible, but somehow my, my, my childhood, anyway, interests me a little bit more now than it did 20 or, or 30 years ago, and somehow uh, there's a parallel that I haven't figured out yet uh, between that 
uh, feeling that, that instinct, uh, and, and letters, maybe because letters were something uh, of, of, the, of the past to the kind of letters that I was uh, talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, maybe we should just try to, maybe writers should try to do that more often, to write each other, uh, uh, you know, letters, even handwritten letters, and, 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 and put them in the mail. I just had an idea, and I thought it was an original idea that I wanted to do. I thought I was going to make a lot of money with an app. I don't know anything about computers, but uh, I was, was going to invent this app, uh, but it's already been invented, that makes the, the typewriter sound. You put it on your computer, and it makes it sound like the typewriter used to sound. I miss that uh, sound. Uh, I, miss, I miss that, uh, the music of, of the typewriter. The, uh, uh, the, the, the various way where it speed up and slow down and uh, but often pauses and I, I, I kind of miss that somebody brings in a, uh, into class today and uh, that, it's already it's probably been around for a long time an app uh, that, that makes you remember uh, what it was what it sounded like to type I said I think I said in class the sound of people working on computers always sounded to me like the sound when uh, when you turn on your light in your kitchen and uh, and you hear all the cockroaches scuttling away. Uh, uh, not that any of you ever had cockroaches. Uh, no poets ever had cockroaches in, 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 their, in their house. But all, all people doing this, Horace, Ovid, uh, Petrarch, I uh, mentioned Dr. I mean, uh, uh, Alexander uh, Pope. Uh, I wonder if uh, I, I started to say Dr. Uh, Dr. J. Uh, who I call, uh, so I call uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson, Dr. J. I wonder if he uh, had any epistolary poems. It wouldn't surprise me. I didn't. Uh, I didn't try to look 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 that up. There's some of the famous examples of letters from Iceland. When I was in college, I didn't know what I was going to do after college. I didn't have a job. Uh, didn't have any money, but so I had this bright idea, I'd go to Iceland. That would, it was a good, cool place for a poet to go, and I'd write a book about being in Iceland. And then I found out that Auden and McNeese had already done that, like 40 years uh, earlier. It, it, it ruined my uh, plans uh, to, to go to Iceland and be the, the, be the first, at least, American poet there writing about Iceland. Uh, Hugo's book, I remember reading this book probably in the... Uh, 70s probably 31 letters and, and 13 dreams uh, it's it's an interesting book and uh, Harrison's book and I'll read you this one poem letters to a saying in uh, the, the Russian uh, poet who, who Harrison loved maybe writing uh, epistolary poems to poets that you loved uh, that, that are probably gone you know poets from the past maybe writing a poem to to Keats uh, I would love to well, I'd love to shake his hand. Uh, if there's any possible way to shake John Keats' hand, I would love to do that, but I can't do that. But I could, we could write him a letter. We could write letters to, uh, to people. Uh, I think probably one of the traps uh, that you need to be careful of in writing a letter, particularly if it's to a, uh, a family member or uh, a beloved or, or something like that, maybe particularly if it's a, a deceased uh, family member, uh, the, the trap of that would be sentimentality, of getting kind of sappy, or maybe only using you know, merely personal details of your relationship with this, this person. Uh, uh, part of any kind of exercise you, you give yourself, or any kind of rules, anything from writing in, in meter and, and traditional meter and rhyme, uh, anything that has rules, you have to try to remember that it in no way inhibits you or imprisons you. The rules of poetry, received uh, forms, or any kind of little rule that you give yourself. If you just say, oh, this is going to be, a before you have six lines of the poem, you say, this is going to be a 20-line poem, and in fact, I'm never going to have more than 11 syllables. I'm going to have between 9 and 11 syllables. Any, any couple little assignments you give yourself will not inhibit you, will not imprison you, but will do just the opposite. It will liberate you. It will force you, because it forces you to think and imagine in ways you, you normally uh, wouldn't imagine. If you, if you decide, and every one of us should do this, uh, you should write a poem in practically every received uh, form. It's part of our apprenticeship and, and, and part of our, 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 our job to keep uh, doing that, uh, to write in received forms. Writing in meter is important to learn how to do that, even if you are writing uh, free verse. 
And probably one of the most important things to remember about writing in meter is it's not so much uh, keeping the exact meter, the perfect meter, all of the way, but it's what Emerson called uh, meter-making arguments. Uh, is that uh, part of the meter is you get the reader leaning one way, you get them expecting one kind of rhythm, and then you put a variation on that. You put usually a reversal, a, 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 most common meter in English, because it's the nature of English, it's an ascending language, that go from short to stress syllables. Uh, uh, most, most English is anapestic and, and iambic by, 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 by nature, uh, but, but you get the reader, reader leaning one way, expecting one thing, and then you, you put this reversal, uh, a spondy or a trochee, which does something to the reader's body. It actually registers in the reader's body. It's some kind of uh, shift. If you look at metrical lines that you love the most, if you're reading a metrical poem uh, that, that you really love, I, I bet that the, the points of greatest pleasure will be around these points of the surprising and, and even physically jarring. I mean, it doesn't like hit you over the head, but it's uh, just a, 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 it's, it's physical, it's physiological. Uh, that's where the, the, a lot of the pleasure is going to be, and that's where a lot of the bang of the poem is, is, is going to be. Uh, I, I keep thinking of that line of Redke's from the little uh, uh, Papa's Waltz, with a, with a hand, with a hand, Anapest, caked hard, bang, bang, spondy, by dirt. Uh, that makes that hand, caked hard by dirt, harder. You can actually uh, feel it in a way, because it's bang, bang, too stressful. So any kind of rule form, even if it's something as loose as an epistolary letter, I would uh, I'd recommend uh, doing it because of the uh, what seem like restraints. They're not. They they make make things happen. Maybe even say this is going to be a twenty line uh, poem letter. Uh, limit it uh, in, in some way. Even something as simple as that will make stuff happen that didn't that wouldn't normally happen. And that's that's part of you know what, what discovery is. No discovery for the reader, no discovery for the writer, said Mr. Frost. If you don't discover something, something doesn't happen when you're working on a poem. Uh, if you don't discover something, then the reader's not going to discover anything when they, when they read it uh, either. That makes uh, perfect sense. Uh, the best definition of uh, a revision I've ever heard is by a painter, I can't remember his name, but he just said, do something, and then do something to that. Do something, do something to that. And then just carry that, and then do something to that, and then do something to the last, and then do something. And uh, who knows, you, you might discover something, that discover something you didn't know you thought uh, or felt about the subject. If really, if you know what you're going to write before you write it exactly, guaranteed wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't poem. Um, I think that's about it, I have to say, about this, this particular, because it's pretty, pretty uh, simple uh, here. Uh, you might want to look at some of these examples, particularly the more contemporary ones. Let me read you the insane uh, poem. He was just nuts about insane, and a lot of people uh, were. I think another thing about my generation of poets is that we were influenced by uh, foreign poets as much as uh, American uh, poets. In the 70s, the, uh, the laws changed somehow with the uh, uh, copyright. and. Uh, all of a sudden, and there was this one incredible anthology called Modern European Poetry uh, that uh, all of a sudden we were introduced. I mean, you could get a poem here and there by, uh, you could get even Neruda in books, but he only had one translator in, in America. Uh, but all of a sudden you're introduced to all of these poets from all over the world. In English, you, you still can't, you know, you don't have the music of the, of the mother tongue, but uh, uh, Yesenin was one of these for me, uh, along with several other of the Russian poets, uh, Stataeva, uh, Ekmatova, um, Mandelstam, uh, se se several others. And I really think it's important if we, if we just read American poetry, then we're only reading a little, a, a small part uh, of the world. And it is, it's only one language, there's only one, one, one poetry. Uh, and, it, and it just happens to be in hundreds of, of different uh, languages. Uh, and to to uh, Jim Harrison, to DG. Uh, this matted and glossy photo of Yesenin bought at a Leningrad newsstand. 
permanently tilted on my desk. He doesn't stare at me. He stares at nothing. The difference between a plane crash and a noose, he, he hung himself. He, he died a suicide and hung himself. And supposedly, this is almost a poet, poet's cliche, uh, probably caused more damage to young poets than uh, a lot of things. In it. But he wrote his last poem, supposedly. Am I thinking of the right guy? He wrote his last poem in blood uh, from, uh, he, hung himself, he hung himself with a coat hanger. Am I thinking of the right guy? Do I have the right Russian poet? No. Uh, hung himself with a coat hanger and then somehow scrawled a poem uh, in his own uh, in his own blood. Uh, his last uh, poem, really a dumb, dumb fucking thing to do. Uh, uh, just really, really dumb. He was uh, his girlfriend was uh, uh, Isadora Duncan, uh, uh, or they were lovers. Uh, anyway. Uh, let me start again. This matted and glossy photo of Yesenin bought at a Leningrad newsstand, permanently tilted on my desk. He doesn't stare at me, he stares at nothing. The difference between a plane crash and a noose adds up to nothing. And what can I do with heroes with my brain fixed on so few of them? Again, nothing. Regard his flat Magazine eyes on my half-cocked own. Both of us see nothing. And the vodka was nothing. Of, and the vodka was nothing. And Isadora was nothing. The pistol waved in New York was nothing. And the plank bridge near your village home in Rye Yasin covered seven feet of nothing. The clumsy noose that swung and tilted the body was nothing but a noose, a law of gravity, this seeking for the ground a few feet of nothing between shoes and the floor a light year away. So this is a song of Hussein's noose, which came to nothing, but did a good job, as we say back home, where there's nothing but snow. But I stood under your balcony in St. Petersburg. Yes, St. Petersburg, a crazed tourist with so much nothing in my heart, it wanted to implode. And I walked down to the Neva embankment with a fine sleet falling, and there was finally something, a great river, vastly flowing, flat as your eyes, something to marry to my nothing heart, other than the poems you hurled into nothing those years before the articulate noose. So he's writing, you know, he's, he's partly complaining, he's angry that he, that he killed himself, uh, he, but, he, but he, loves his, he loves his poem, so it's a kind of homage and it's quarreling with him a little bit. Of course, he never got the letter, uh, he was dead, he didn't get the letter, but uh, there's just so many, so many possibilities uh, that you could do with this, uh, with this kind of uh, poem. So I recommend you try them, I recommend you try all sorts of uh, uh, exercises more often. Now they're called prompts, and uh, uh, that's to me a little bit different than, a, than an exercise, but uh, any kind of formal exercise, trust, uh, it'll make something happen. Rules make something happen. Uh, they do not diminish us, uh, uh, diminish or, you know, again, uh, imprison our imaginations. They, they are, rules are liberating. Uh, thanks.